Dr. Nardi here, back with another video. And in this video, we're going to talk about the challenges associated with finding uh, good quality measures. So there are uh, numerous ways uh, to obtain measures. Um, and I think especially now with the advent of obtaining them electronically, you do not have the issue of having to go physically obtain them, like actually go to the library and pick them out. But what you will have to do is learn how to identify what a good scale of measurement is. And you do that by looking at the literature. So looking at the literature will give you the idea of what a good scale of measurement actually looks like. And also um, you have to make sure you get these scales early on in your research process. So you have to get them and include them in an IRB approval uh, that has to be done before data collection occurs. And when we talk in this video about evaluating the quality of a measure, you might think, well, what does that entail? Well, one, you have to look at the measure's validity. Does the measure measure what it's intended to measure? That's a lot of measures. But if you're looking at um, a certain psychological construct, does the instrument measure that psychological construct? If it does, then it's valid. If it doesn't, then maybe you should pick a different instrument. So with measure validity, you have to know whether the instrument is measuring what it claims to measure. So if you are developing a psychological instrument, or I should say if you find a psychological instrument and you're looking at maybe anxiety, you have to make sure that instrument measures anxiety and not something related. The other important piece is looking at reliability. The way we can look at reliability is the way in which uh, when you administer the instrument or survey, same word, same synonym, multiple times, you should get roughly the same result. For example, if I give you a personality test and I give you it at time point A and you score a certain parameter, if I give it to you at time point B, you should also score that certain parameter. And in the literature, we, also, we often look for Cronbach's alpha. Um, and that's basically how um, internally consistent uh, each item is with each other and basically how each item correlates with uh, other items. And, and we'll get more into this, but we want, generally speaking, a high Cronbach's alpha. It gives you an indication of, again, the internal consistency of the instrument. The other thing we care about is construct validity, and that is talking about uh, does, again, if we're looking at intelligence, is your instrument actually measuring intelligence? Or if you're looking at self-esteem, is your instrument actually measuring self-esteem? We also want to look at the length of the instrument. You don't want it too long or too short, which we'll talk about because uh, participants might get tired and stop taking it or they just start answering, you know, in a certain pattern. And we'll talk about that. And you also want to make sure the items are not too difficult. Uh, you want to make sure you word them in a way that it's easily understandable by the average uh, reader. I think the other issue that often researchers, especially new researchers, run into is getting a uh, scoring guide. So you, when you pick a survey for your papers, you have to identify how the instrument was scored by the original researchers, and then you have to implement that in your study. So that's very important. Pick an instrument where you know exactly how the researchers who created it scored it. So I would tell every person interested in research is the first thing you have to do is you have to determine the variable or variables of interest. What are you interested in studying? Uh, if you're looking at anxiety, you need an instrument that measures anxiety. If you're looking at perceived control, you're looking at, you need an instrument that measures perceived control. If you're looking at the relationship between anxiety and perceived control, then you'll need an instrument, each maybe two instruments, one that measures perceived control, the other that measures anxiety. And when you find these instruments, uh, they will already be on a scale. And remember your whole goal often with these surveys is to describe and measure behavior. So you wanna pick an instrument that seems to do a great job at that of describing and measuring the behavior that you're interested in. And by the way, no instrument is perfect. All instruments fall short in some way. Uh, they might include extra questions that are unrelated uh, to your concepts that you're looking at. You probably want to include those in your study. You always collect more data than you need. Uh, there also might be some overlap between theoretical concepts. Uh, again, 
we do our best here. No instrument is perfect. You want to find an instrument that's as close as it can be to what you're looking at. Often students uh, have to measure these abstract concepts. That's what we do in psychology is we measure abstract constructs like anxiety or happiness or sadness or uh, anger. And these are just emotions. It's a whole field, right, of different constructs we can look at. And the problem we have is it's hard to, one, we have to come up with a conceptual definition, right? So we describe what we mean by anxiety. But more importantly, we have to operationalize our definition or basically saying, how are you going to measure it? You have to be very, very specific. Creating an operational definition is key to your research study. You need to exactly define how you're going to measure, for example, anxiety. How are you going to do it? You're going to give this instrument that has this many questions. So the whole point here is to quantify the instrument you're going to use. So for example, if you're looking at safe driving behavior, uh, you might want to measure it by counting the number of times a driver comes to a complete stop at a particular stop sign. But you have this concept of safe driving, and the whole point is you have to operationalize it or say exactly how you're going to measure it. And you want to be clear about that in your research as well and in your paper. The other thing to keep in mind is the measurement subtypes or uh, what uh, type of data are you going to be analyzing? Because depending on the type of data you use depends on the type of statistical analysis you'll use. And if you think back to your early stats courses or if you maybe never taken a stats course, the four types of measurements, we'll go into a little more detail in a minute. So nominal scales of measurement often have no inherent order, and these questions can be answered yes or no. Ordinal scales of measurement, uh, values are ordered, but they're not equally spaced, and we'll talk more about that, what that looks like. The third type of scales, interval measurement, and these values are ordered and equally spaced uh, throughout, but uh, there is no true zero. That's something to keep in mind, and we'll talk about what that looks like. And then ratio is your highest level. That's your fourth level. And there's equal intervals, and it has a true zero point. I always tell researchers, collect the most precise data you can. So if you can collect ratio data, you should. You can always turn into a lower, quote unquote, order data set. You can never go the other way. So if you collect ordinal data, you can never turn into ratio, but you can turn ratio data into ordinal, if that makes sense. So as I said, nominal data, uh, there is no uh, inherent order. Uh, this produces categorical data. Uh, and usually what you could do with this is do some kind of frequency analysis or some kind of chi-square analysis or use a non-parametric statistic. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about non-parametrics. But um, so an example might be, um, do you own a car? And your answer might be yes or no. Right. So usually these questions fit into a perfect category or you might ask about someone's uh, sex. Are they male, female? For the purpose of this uh, video, we'll just say male, female. You have to pick one. Um, and maybe it's political affiliation. Are you Republican, Democrat, uh, liberal, whatever it might be? But the whole thing is you have to be in mutually exclusive categories. Right. You can't be in both. You have to pick one. That's kind of a hallmark of nominal scales of measurement. Ordinal scales of measurement, their values are ordered but not equally spaced. Um, again, this is more information than nominal data. And by the way, you could use a Spearmint uh, a row or a, a, a Kendall's uh, test for this. Um, but here's the thing with this kind of data, right? So the values are ordered but not equally spaced. It's kind of like if I picked my top three uh, favorite students in a psychology course, right? I might rank them, but there's not equally space between them. I might say person X is my favorite, followed by person Y, then person Z. But again, there's no true equal spacing between them. Interval scales of measurement, uh, they, we often refer to these as continuous uh, data. This is the most widely used scale and probably what you'll be using uh, for your uh, projects, if you take on projects in the future, or if you end up doing research or whatever you go on to do, most likely you'll see uh, interval scale measurements. And what we have here is usually you see Likert scale data where we uh, anchors are equally spaced. So if you have like five point Likert scale, you know, one, never, five, always, we know those points are equally spaced along the, um, the distance on the scale. 
Uh, we use parametric statistics uh, for this, but the key here is there is no true zero. Um, so uh, there's no absolute zero, which we'll talk about here in the next slide, but this is the next higher level of data. And finally, we have ratio. This actually has a true zero. If we think about temperature, there is a uh, absolute zero where there's actually no molecular movement. Um, things like that, where there's actually a true zero you can get, these are ratio scales. So here's the thing too, when you think about what instruments you're gonna use, is you wanna think it's about its ability to, to, uh, to detect differences. Um, so usually what you'll see uh, is more fine grain instruments have like seven choices for participants, uh, where you know five is good, maybe seven's better, probably three is not good, but the number of anchors usually, you want to be most precise. So usually you see five to seven is typical. So you might ask, how do I find instruments in the literature? Start reading studies. Look for existing instruments that you want. Go to the library, uh, go to Google Scholar, which is a great resource. Look for those keywords um, that you're looking for. Go jump to the method section in the paper because that'll often tell you what instruments they use and they'll often cite those. And you'll see there in the method section, they'll have participants, that's who was in the study, materials, apparatus, measures, instruments might be called that, uh, but that's where you find the instrument and then the procedures, how they did it. So go jump to that measures section of the study. What you'll see in the literature is the name of the instrument used, and you should always cite that. They'll give you the psychometric properties of the instrument, so they'll tell you Generally speaking, if they, for example, Cronbach's alpha, they'll give you a Cronbach's alpha number, or if they did some kind of factor analysis, they'll give you that. Um, and see what instruments come up a lot. Usually those common instruments are the better instruments. Um, often though, they're not the full instruments not in there because there's a page restriction for journal articles. So you might have to email the original authors and ask if you could use their instrument. You always wanna ask for permission. That's good uh, etiquette. So a great resource is Psych Test. Uh, it's provided through the American Psychological Association. Uh, it contains about 55,000 records. And actually, this, the instruments go back to 1896. There's actual whole tests in there, or at least some sample items you could see. Uh, there's also information about the psychometric property of the test as well. Just because a test comes up first doesn't mean it's the most reliable. You have to go look at the Cronbach's alpha number. And remember, the higher the number, the more reliable the instrument is. So you have to kind of go in there and take a look at the test yourself. Don't just pick the first test you find. You can also uh, go look in the references of papers to find the instrument. That's often a good tactic. Uh, you can look at the Encyclopedia of Psychological Assessment or Measures for Clinical Practice and Research. Uh, these are great uh, resources to find uh, tests on there. You could also look at the Directory of Unpublished Experimental Mental Measures. You can also ask Maybe if your department has uh, frequently used scales, they could let you uh, look at. Uh, clinical measures are often great, but they require advanced training, uh, such as the Wexler's Adult Intellectual Scale. Again, you need advanced training to administer these tests. So uh, if you don't have the training, then maybe these aren't the best for your research project. Uh, the other great place is to go look at master's and PhD theses uh, in your department or you could search the database online uh, specifically. ProQuest is a great for this to look at theses and master's uh, uh, dissertations, or I should say thesis for master's and dissertation for PhDs, and they often have complete instruments in their studies. Here's the thing I'll tell all my viewers to avoid is uh, don't pay for the measures. You can go get free tests. Go look at MindGarden. There are some free tests there. Also, make sure you check psych tests before paying for anything. Again, explore your options. Do not just pay for a test. So there are two main emphases of reliability. And that is uh, thinking about uh, the idea of consistency. So we like test retest reliability. That's what I mentioned earlier in the video. If I give you a test at time point one, you should get roughly the same result at time point two. This is the repeatability of the measure over time. Um, the other thing you wanna look at is you wanna look at the validity of the instrument, right? The claims of the assessment. You wanna know if the instrument is measuring what it claims to measure. 
So usually evaluating reliability is a little bit easier than evaluating validity. So as I was saying about test retest reliability, we usually can look at the correlation between time point one and time point two. And you want that correlation to be relatively high. And often you want a long gap between administrations because you don't want participants to remember what they did or how they answered. So you'll see Pearson's R. So that's, remember, that's a correlation, measure of correlation. And that's usually what you use to look at uh, test retest reliability. There's also parallel forms reliability. We also can refer to this as alternative forms. And basically what you do is you give two different versions of the test and you want to see how your new items correlate with your old items. And uh, you want them to, to correlate highly if they're relative, uh, relatively similar. And the key here is the items must be similar in difficulty for the test to be truly parallel. Content validity represents, uh, is your test measuring your domain of interest? So if I give you a test that's looking at your math knowledge, but I give you history questions, that would not be good in the content validity source because I should be really giving you history questions, not uh, math questions. Face validity is looking at the test and seeing if it appears to measure what it's claiming to measure, just looking at the face of it. Criterion related validity is the next type of validity we'll talk about. And there are two types, predictive and concurrent. Uh, predictive tries to make some kind of uh, prediction about the future, like an SAT score, how well you'll do in college. And concurrent is basically how well you're doing right now in this moment in time. And then construct validity can be broken down to convergent and divergent. And basically what that means is if it's convergent validity, you want to see uh, the agreement between two measures hypothesized to be theoretically related. If we're thinking about divergent validity, you want to see if these measures are theoretically unrelated if that's what you hypothesize. Uh, one thing I, I want to caution everybody is uh, you want to make sure your tests are not too long. Uh, sometimes if your test is too long, then your participants will get tired and just start, you know, answering a uh, answers randomly just because they gave up or they might quit your exam. So you might need to eliminate one or more measures if it's too many questions. So you want to consider the number of items and the number of scales. You want to keep that in mind. These people are volunteers. So you want to be conscientious of their time. Usually though, there's no hard and fast rule just as an FYI, but you want to keep it up to about 45 minutes. You also often will pilot test your study to see how well it works. You also want to make sure the reading level of the item is uh, uh, a level of reading that most participants can uh, master. Um, you don't want to give them super hard technical psychology words often because your average person doesn't know what that means. So you want to make sure that your test is written in a way that people can understand it. All right. So you want to keep an eye on your scoring uh, when you're actually putting your uh, data into SPSS, whatever program you're using. Items might be reverse coded or reverse scored, so you might have to flip those around. And you also might have to look at the item subscale. With all that said, thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care. Bye-bye.